Inspired by Catholic intellectual tradition, the University of St. Thomas educates students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely, and work skillfully to advance the common good. You have come to a great place, and we'll begin by taking a look at the paths taken to get here today. The decade of the 1990s dawned with an announcement that St. Thomas would call itself what it had become, a university. The two-building Fry Science and Engineering Center opened on the former seminary campus in 1997. Morrison Hall opened in 1998 to accommodate growing student housing needs. This is around the time that many of you, our newest students, were welcomed into this world and began the journey of growing into toddlers. As kids, you had smiles that made life worth living and goofy mannerisms that could turn any mood to laughter. You learned to crawl, read, and shared many wonderful experiences with your family. While you began your educational journey with kindergarten, St. Thomas was working to shape itself into the outstanding university it is today. In the year 2000, St. Thomas expanded to Rome, Italy with the opening of the Bernardi campus. The following year, St. Thomas Law School opened in Minneapolis. In 2005, Flynn Residence Hall opened. Around this time, you were making friends in middle school and looking forward to high school. About the time you started high school, St. Thomas was celebrating its 125th anniversary. The Anderson Athletic and Recreation Complex opened in September of 2010. Just this past January, the new Anderson Student Center opened. As you were graduating high school, Father Dennis Deese announced his 2013 retirement from St. Thomas after serving 22 years as our president. As you transition into college, memories of your childhood may flow through your mind. Often your family members and loved ones are proud of your growth and looking forward to your future. The University of St. Thomas is your next step. And while we've grown and developed just like you, we are ready for you. We can't wait to get to know you, our class of 2016, the best first year class ever. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Tommies. <laughs> That's the first time you hear that. You are now officially Tommies. My name is Father Eric Rutten. I'm the director of campus ministry and the chaplain on campus. And I want to welcome you here this morning. We're very excited, delighted to have you with us this morning. What I want to do before we even start the day is just call to mind what a special moment this is. If you had a chance to view that video, part of that video that we just saw is comparing your own lives to the development of the university. The point is, all the changes that you've all been going through, and this is a new chapter, a new moment. And so I think it's really key and really important to stop and recognize that and say a little prayer. So that's, that's what I'm here for this morning. So I invite us all. I'm going to pray in the Catholic tradition, but I invite you just to join me as you are able. I invite us now to just call to mind that God is present with us. God of life and love, you surround us with the beauty and the mysteries of life. We give you thanks for the gift of this day and for new opportunities to grow and develop in mind, body, and spirit. In your care and in your providence, you have called us together here at the University of St. Thomas. When we could be so many places, you have brought us here. We thank you for the gift of each and every one of these new students, and we are blessed by their presence. Almighty God, we ask you to bless them as they begin this new adventure in their lives. Send your spirit in a special way upon them. Guide them each and every day. Lord, fill them with your wisdom. Give them always a desire for truth and for charity of heart. Grant that their time here at the University of St. Thomas may deepen and enrich them. God, we ask that you also bless their families and their friends. Keep them always connected, even though that might become more difficult these days. Keep them all connected and united in love. 
And we ask you to send your spirit to be with all of us so that together we may truly be a community of support and learning for one another. In all our ways, make us people of truth, goodness, and love. Amen. And I now uh, invite uh, Dr. Sue Huber to come forward. She is our Executive Vice President and Chief Academic Officer. Have a wonderful day. Good morning, everyone. You sounded pretty lively out there. Too early, I hear. OK, well, you'll perk up. I want to welcome you. On behalf of Father Dennis Deese, the president of the university, the Office of Academic Affairs, and all of the faculty, welcome to parents, students, guests, everyone who's here. And especially, I want to welcome those incoming freshmen you know, I look out there and it's getting more and more difficult to tell the freshmen from others who are here. So freshmen, let me see, where are you? All of those who are prospective students. All right, lots of you out there, excellent. I think you're ready for campus life. You responded to Tommy's, right? Okay, you're ready. As Father Rutten said, I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Academic Officer and my responsibility here, in a nutshell, is to oversee the academic operation of the university or to see that the mission, the academic mission, is central to what we do here. We do our best to teach students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely, work skillfully to advance the common good. That's our mission. And if you really think about that mission, it's one tall order. I'm guessing that most of you are here today because St. Thomas captured your attention in some specific way. I would imagine some of you were especially impressed by the university's spiritual dimension. We are a Catholic university. Some of you probably are very interested in our co-curricular activities. Some of you are probably interested in our, our athletic opportunities. And because I'm the academic officer, I'm hoping that all of you are interested in our excellent educational opportunities. I'm really very confident that our academic life and our mission is going to meet your expectations, whatever those expectations are. And I can truly promise you that you are going to meet extraordinary professors. You'll meet some of them today. They're going to do their best to teach you to think critically to write analytically, to carry on research projects, and to celebrate all of your academic achievements. They are here really because of you and for you, and they take their scholarship and their teaching very, very seriously. I know you're going to find St. Thomas committed to the pursuit of truth, academic excellence, and most importantly, St. Thomas is committed to you, to what each and every one of you bring to this community. I want to thank you for coming today. You are going to have an outstanding visit, an orientation, a rich full day. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Jordan, Associate Vice President for Undergraduate Studies and Academic Advisement. Michael. Thank you very much, Sue, and uh, good morning. And I am glad that we have a few minutes together to reflect on the values that inform the St. Thomas undergraduate curriculum. Much excitement and a few cares press upon us all as the new St. Thomas students among us prepare for this next important stage in their lives. But I invite you to push those cares aside for just a few minutes and consider why we are here. Be assured that St. Thomas faculty members have thoughtfully created the curriculum I am about to describe and will guide the new students through it as their teachers and mentors. I will speak to you briefly about the goals of the St. Thomas core curriculum and then we'll call upon a faculty member and a recent graduate to offer you a quick glimpse into their experience of the value and indeed the beauty of a liberal education. 
Blessed Pope John Paul II wrote that the Catholic University was born from the heart of the church. And indeed, the Catholic identity of the University of St. Thomas forms what we call the overarching principle of the core curriculum. But in what ways specific to the nature of academic life is this true? And what is the contemporary importance of each component of this principle? First, our curriculum is built on the affirmation that faith and reason are compatible and complementary. Indeed, they interact upon one another fruitfully. Now consider the many difficult and pressing controversies in our world and in our country concerning the relationship between religion and politics, or religion and science, for example. At their heart, these are controversies about the relationship between faith and reason. Students who learn to integrate faith and reason will bring light and healing to many areas of our world. Second, our curriculum is built on the knowledge that we are all created to live together in community. There are numerous public policy, economic, and political issues active in our world right now concerning the question of our responsibilities for one another in our communities. We affirm that wisdom, by its nature, serves the well-being of our neighbor. Third, our curriculum is built on the knowledge that we and all other persons are endowed with worth and dignity. Possessions, positions of power and prestige, even accomplishments, do not raise us above others in terms of ultimate human dignity. Our gifts should be cultivated without pride. Our needs should be made known and served without humiliation. From this recognition flows our celebration of the love of learning. Now these three principles, complementarity of faith and reason, our communal nature, and our inherent human dignity, give a particular form to what has long been called liberal education. Human culture is a complex collaborative construction with roots and future continuity that exceed the, the reach of any one of our lifetimes. The languages, codes, institutions, and modes of thought and conceptualization that are the basis of this collaborative construction of culture are brought to light and studied by the disciplines at the heart of the core curriculum. Those who merely try to find a place within the construction of culture as though it were a massive machine surrender some degree of their power to judge and think for themselves to affirm with knowledge what is good, to offer innovation and correction to what is deficient. Our core curriculum offers the liberating power of knowledge for all who pursue freedom through learning. But the faculty has not forgotten that education also is a path through which students find a place of fruitful service and participation in some corner of the world. All students pursue a major field of study, and even though only some major fields carry names that identify a particular type of work, such as engineering or business, all major fields of study serve as preparation for the pursuit of a career. Both liberal education and career preparation are intended to serve the common good. We hope we enable our students to define success and fulfillment to include the full and joyful exercise of one's talent and energy in building up and sustaining a community whose ultimate bond is love. So what are the fields of study of the core curriculum? The orientation and registration guidebook contains a detailed account. Students will learn more later this morning about the importance of this core curriculum when they meet with a faculty member in an academic expectation session and at the end of the day, students will meet with a counselor to see how their schedules will give them an opportunity to begin their study of the core curriculum. For now, I'll say a few sentences about each area of study. The academic study of theology is the ideal way to learn how our lives and the human communities in which we live are built and sustained by faith 
in dialogue with all areas of culture. Our world needs people who can contribute knowledgeably to this dialogue. Philosophy courses encourage the development of the love of wisdom and the cultivation of a student's rational power in pursuit of what is true and good. Achieving a philosophical understanding of our nature as human persons, developing our powers of logical reasoning, and learning how to recognize and identify the good in human action through ethics serves our world well. Literature and writing. Our lives wither and we grow narrow and weak when we don't cultivate our powers of language and learn to respond fruitfully to exemplary uses of language. Local theater director Michelle Hensley describes the palpable hunger for the richness of language made evident by spectators when she brings performances of Shakespeare's plays to audiences who don't often have the opportunity to enjoy such works. The study of writing and literature nourishes intellect and spirit. In the fine arts, we know that our most remote ancestors applied pigments to the walls of caves in highly artful and probably worshipful ways, and that music emerged at the same time as language and early forms of drama not much later. There is no culture that does not incorporate art within its repertoire. Our lives expand to the extent that we know how to respond to art in its many forms. In the area of historical studies, memory, chronicle, exploration and analysis of sources, accounts of the developments and causes that serve as the temporal foundation of every area of life we know, the arts of historical inquiry enable us to live with an expanded temporal perspective. Study of foreign language, oh, sorry, social analysis. We live and participate in the midst of many different social forces. Some shape the economic dimension of our lives, some shape the ways in which we experience inclusion and exclusion in, in the interplay of communities. Some indicate the ways in which our own individual psychology takes form. The disciplines of economics, sociology, geography, and psychology bring to light essential areas of our social lives. In the area of language and culture, when we learn a language different from the one in which we first discovered ourselves, we better understand the many important and subtle ways in which language shapes how we see and experience the world. Human diversity, an exercise as simple as examining the rosters of a contemporary Major League Baseball team or a symphony orchestra, reveals how diverse our society has become. Understanding the tensions, challenges, and opportunities available through the interactions of different cultures is an essential part of contemporary liberal education. Finally, for several centuries now, mathematics and science have shaped our world and our understanding of that world. No one can hope to address most contemporary issues of public policy without some knowledge of the nature of scientific and mathematical reasoning. These fields of study constitute the University of St. Thomas core curriculum. This is the foundation for the ed educational journey upon which our new students are about to embark. Now there is a deep secret of the core curriculum that is rarely named, but because you've been good enough to be attentive during this little talk, I will reveal it to you now. The core curriculum comes to life only through the effort of each student who ardently pursues it. The core curriculum comes to life only through the effort of each student who ardently pursues it. Nothing gives me greater pleasure as a teacher than to see the face of a student illuminated by an intellectual discovery. My hope for you is to experience that joy of learning. Let me turn now to my colleague, psychology professor Greg Robertson Riegler, to tell about his experience of liberal education. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. That's pretty weak. Okay, this will all be on the test at the end of the day, so pay close attention. 
Um, as Dr. Jordan said, uh, my name is Greg Robinson Riggler. I'm a professor in the psychology department. Um, and I've been here for over 20 years, and I've, I'm very excited to have the privilege to speak to you all about my experience with the general education curriculum and, and in general, the academics here. Uh, you're all about to start on an exciting lifelong journey. Uh, mine began when I joined the UST faculty over 20 years ago. As an undergraduate at a large institution, University of Cincinnati, I didn't really appreciate the idea of a core curriculum. In fact, I'm not even sure if they had a core curriculum. I knew there was a bunch of courses I had to take. Uh, but since joining the faculty here at UST, I, I have truly experienced what Dr. Jordan um, referred to as the core curriculum coming to life. I've thought hard about the different areas of the curriculum, uh, their interconnections, and their relevance to the work in my discipline of psychology. Um, I've sat in on colleagues' classes. I've team taught with colleagues from, I think, seven or eight different disciplines. I feel like I'm in my 22nd year of college. And before you panic, you won't be here for 22 years. Uh, the goal of the core curriculum, as you've heard from Dr. Huber and Dr. Jordan, is to stimulate intellectual growth and inquiry and to serve the university's mission to educate students to be morally responsible leaders who think critically, act wisely, and work skillfully to serve the common good. All of you will be following your own path, branching from a major or area of interest uh, that you wish to pursue. But importantly, your education in that area of interest is going, to be is going to be grounded in the liberal arts core, the general education curriculum. And a major that's grounded in the rich soil of liberal arts is going to yield a much fuller and more fruitful tree. Now, my major um, professor, but I, I would say it's my major, is cognitive psychology. Cognitive psychology is a branch of psychology that gets into um, remembering, thinking, uh, reasoning, problem solving. Um, and in my years of work at UST, I've developed a really deep appreciation for the way that this field, and indeed all fields, um, connect with all of the areas of the core. Dr. Jordan highlighted these areas, and now for each one, I want to highlight a connection to a discipline, to, to each of the areas of the core curriculum. So faith in the Catholic tradition. Um, my expertise is in human memory, kind of within cognitive psychology, I'm a, I'm a memory expert. And I was excited to uh, discover an intriguing connection. How does the oral tradition of the Gospels reflect the operation of human memory? I, I was privileged enough to, to teach a uh, co-teach a course with a theology professor on this using the book Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Really neat connections there. Uh, moral and philosophical reasoning. Psychology's most obvious connection and maybe the deepest connection might be to philosophy as both have knowledge and mind as, as central focuses. But another, uh, you'll, be, you'll be taking a philosophy course on ethics, and that's also a critical question for a research psychologist. For example, uh, is research with animals ethically acceptable? And if so, under what conditions or what types of research? Uh, literature involves the written artistic expression of the human experience. One especially relevant domain for a psychologist and for a memory psychologist is memoir. I taught a, a course with a colleague in English on uh, the genre of memoir, which involves you know, a person telling their own life story. And we considered the issue of you know, how are memoirs and autobiographies influenced by the operation of memory, which is reconstructive and limited. Historical studies. History provides some interesting connections for a psychologist as well. For, exa for example, how have conceptions of mental illness and our treatment of the mentally ill changed throughout the course of US history? Language and culture. Familiarity with other languages and cultures has become increasingly important in today's interconnected world. And there's been some new, uh, not real new, but there's been, always been a lot of research on the uh, benefits of thinking in more than one language, of, of being multilingual. And psychologists have found that there are certain benefits that derive from that, most notably kind of control of attention. So there's some really interesting connections there. On a similar note, it behooves us to understand cultural perspectives that are different from our own. Within psychology, the field of cross-cultural psychology, which links into human diversity, helps us understand how thinking processes like attention, problem-solving, memory, um, are different and similar among cultures. Fine arts. The topic of creativity is a fascinating field of inquiry for a psychologist, uh, especially a cognitive psychologist. What is creativity? What makes a person creative? 
These questions couple nicely with the area of fine arts, which explores various domains of artistic expression, and what goes on inside the brain of a creative person. Finally, another very closely coupled area with psychology in particular is the natural sciences and math and quantitative reasoning. All human behavior takes place in a physical world, so it's critical to have some familiarity with the disciplinary perspectives of the physical sciences. For a psychologist especially, a basic appreciation for physical sciences is critical for understanding the nature of psychological problems like addiction. Finally, back to my, my home area, social analysis, that's where psychology fits in in the core. It's one of five disciplines uh, in the social analysis category. Um, this semester, I'm going to be teaching a uh, course with a political scientist on the, basically the psychology of the presidential election and some of the, some of the uh, psychological factors that come into the choice that we have to make there. So clearly, my grounding as a psychologist is stronger for having been exposed to all of these dis disciplinary perspectives and questions. I'm excited for you, really, to, as you begin your journey, and I challenge you to make those same sorts of connections with your own area of interest and more generally with your lived experience. That will bring the core curriculum to life for you, and you'll be all the richer for it. Now I'm going to hand things over to Christina for a student's perspective on a UST education. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Christina Weiberg. I am a recent St. Thomas graduate. My major was communications and journalism with a minor in Spanish. Um, and I'm one of the orientation interns that will be helping you out throughout the day. So, the beauty of a core curriculum is often, in the eyes of a student, just another hurdle to jump through to get that eight and a half by 11 piece of paper called a diploma. <laughs> and for the majority of my undergraduate career, that was also true of me. I think the scales finally tipped in my favor when I got to watch Pride and Prejudice and Crimson Tide for my philosophy class. As a student during the first day of class, I sat there thinking, wait, what? Pride and Prejudice, a Denzel Washington war movie? This class is gonna be sweet. <laughs> Although it may surprise you, my philosophy class is not the only one to integrate anything from pop culture to counterculture to multicultural to international into the phrase core curriculum. Going off of that, you could almost say the core becomes a yes and. It is core and overarching. It is core and overwhelming. It is core and awe-inspiring. I mean, who would have guessed that my first English professor would encourage persuasive essays between Pizza Hut and Domino's? <laughs> or that my second Engli English professor would have the biggest dreadlocks I had ever seen in my entire life? <laughs> How about the fact that my first theology professor had been a priest for 30 years, my second theology professor was from Turkey, and my third theology professor had lived in Israel? Even if this specific class isn't your idea of a good time or what you want to study in college, there are ways to make it interesting and applicable for your diverse interests. For science, you could take women, medicine, and biology, or oceanography. What about philosophy in Tibet? Or theology in Italy? Come on, who wouldn't want to take English in London? Or what about the many service learning opportunities they have right here in the Twin Cities? You could volunteer and get graded for it. There are paired options courses where you can learn how geology and theology connect through history and cultural development. For my fine arts requirement, I took film one, introduction to the art of film. Who knew that learning different aspects of filming would later lead me to take the Hispanic Cinema Studies course for my Spanish minor? What about the hundreds of students walking around this campus who can draw all of the countries in the world because of their world geography class? What I'm trying to say is there are more options than you could ever imagine. At the very least, I would suggest getting to know other students in your classes. A friend in my first English class went on to become a star player for the football team. Another friend ended up studying abroad in a top business school in London for a year. I also made friends who worked at least 30 hours a week and still got better grades than I did. All of this may sound exciting to some of you. Others may be overwhelmed. Others still may be completely bored out of your mind. And each of those emotions are completely understandable and okay. Each of your lived experiences are completely different from the person sitting next to you and will continue to be so throughout college. Just like you will most likely hear and possibly have heard already, college is what you make it. Well, so is the core curriculum. I have friends who joined the Peace Corps because of the core curriculum. I know others who went on to graduate school because of the core curriculum. I also know those who decided not to go to graduate school because of the core curriculum. There are so many options and so much you will learn. The core curriculum doesn't have to be another hurdle to jump through in order to graduate. 
It also doesn't need to be just another bunch of classes you take. As a current St. Thomas alumna, I can see how the core curriculum has created a unique experience that has pushed me outside of my boundaries and understandings. It has also pulled me closer to the roots I was raised in, as well as helped me to develop the woman and lifelong learner I've become. The core curriculum didn't just teach me that it takes 21 days to develop a habit, or the fact that Voltaire was actually a pretty interesting guy. It helped me to recognize traits and aspirations that I should have in my life, but also understand how nature and nurture work together to create a holistic person. And let's be honest, if you're working to become a part of the real world, why not understand how different parts of it function before you're thrown into it? I encourage you, as one student to another, to take the core curriculum as a chance to develop and hone your passions. Try something you never thought you would. Make the core curriculum another step toward accomplishing your personal and professional goals. Trust me, you'll thank yourself for it later. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jane Canney, Vice President for Student Affairs, who has been working with undergraduate students for over 30 years.